Hello people, Juggler here. I do know there are some guides out there for the Oni, but I figured I'd give it my best shot at explaining the killer and break down his power and playstyle. Before I get started, I'm going to be going over the following. The basics, the first hit, blood management, builds, maps, the 180 flick, and my personal favourite tricks. And then I'll put them in a tier list. I'll also leave timestamps in the um, description so you'll be able to see where to go if you just want to say look at the 180 flick or you just want to look at certain things. So let's get started with the basics. Oni's power is unique in the fact that he starts the game very, very weak. He's basically an M1 killer and he needs blood orbs to gain his secondary ability. To gain blood orbs, you have to hit survivors. Hitting a health survivor grants you 40% of your power. Once a survivor is injured, they drop two orbs every four seconds naturally. They drop a further two orbs for performing actions, throwing pallets, vaulting, etc. That can be changed with add-ons, but I'll go over that in a little bit. Now, a lot of people will go for the same survivor and basically suck the orbs up as they chase them. This will take a while. This is why I prefer to do things slightly different. If I have hit a survivor, I tend to try and locate another survivor straight after to gain 80 orbs very quickly, especially as I do tend to use Lethal Pursuer, as most people will know if they've watched any of my videos. I do enjoy that perk. I think it's really, really strong. I think it's an S-tier perk for Oni. Orbs on the ground are visible to you once within 35 meters of them, and there can only be 100 orbs on the map at any one time. So essentially you can have 2.5 charges of your blood power at any one time on the floor, because 100 orbs equals 250% of your power, because every orb is 2.5% of your charge. So bear that in mind. One full charge of your power sat on the floor. This could be scattered loosely, which isn't great. Good survivors will go to the outskirts of the map or reset where completed gens are. So if you know you are against good players, search these areas. Also, once 100 orbs are on the floor, the survivors will stop dropping orbs. So map knowledge is one of the Oni's greatest tools. Okay, so you've gained his power. Do you use it? I'd say not straight away, unless you know where other survivors are. Gen management is crucial to the Oni. I tend to have in my mind where at least two survivors are at all times. That way you can juggle your power. His power snowballs more once you have the hooks. Once you've used your power, you put away your sword and bring out a spiked mace. This can insta down survivors one of two ways. So the first way is just by simply holding your regular attack. You need to hold M1 for at least 0.35 seconds. Now, I'm not going to lie, this is a muscle memory thing for me. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and like count seconds down. So just the more you play the Oni, the more you'll realize when to release an M1 to get an insta down. If you just tap it, or hold for less than 0.35 seconds, it will not be an insta down, it'll just be a basic M1, but it won't even be a basic attack. Two seconds is the maximum amount of time you can hold this strike for, then it'll just release automatically. So you need to get your angles just right. Aiming towards a survivor and pushing forward is basically an insta down lunge. If the survivor is on top of you, say at a hook, or you just trap them in a corner, just hold M1, don't push forward, and you'll slam down exactly where you stood and you'll down them. That's a very basic ability. Now onto the real fun times. The demon dash is another part of his toolkit, another part of his power. Holding the second reaction button will cause the Oni to wind up and begin sprinting at 195% movement speed, base kit. So a little slower than Billy's chainsaw. It takes two seconds to wind this up into this mode and it has a lot of ways to be manipulated. So with all that learned and mastered, you're ready to take it to the next level, which is tricks. Whilst using your demon dash, you only have 45 seconds base kit, so you want to use it really wisely. Right now I'm showing you that you can manipulate the game a little bit. If you are holding forward, it's basically like having stabilizers, so you go a little bit more slow on the turn in. If you release forward, you'll be able to whip round things a lot easier, you can have a lot more free movement. And it's good to like nod your head up and down as you're, as you're moving, because you get way more vision, you can see what you're doing, and you can get around corners easier, and it's easier for nosing against um, objects, like pressing your character's face against things and just whipping around corners nice and easy. And then if you want to be really smart with the game, especially if, on, if you're on an indoor map, you can mash A and D, or go side to side very quickly, and that'll make it so your speed goes a lot slower, and it makes it so much easier to like manipulate the game and go around maps, traverse maps like in intricate areas a lot slower. So as you're watching now, I'm mashing it side to side, and look how slow I'm going, but I'm still technically dashing. The harder you mash it, the slower you go, basically. Really good on maps like the Doctor's Map, or RPD, so you can just get around corners nice and slowly, but nice and easy. And then you can just whip into speed once you go to like a straight. I treat the Oni like an M1 killer, even when I'm in his power. That is my main trick with him. I hide my red stain and trick survivors, causing a 100% chance to escape to become a 50-50. So you might see in some of my videos, I just swing at the air or it looks like there's nobody around. There's usually a reason why I'm doing this. And that reason is because it is a 50-50 in my mind. If I flash my red stain to someone on one side, I usually fake the other and follow up with basically I'll do this trick throughout a match. 
and then just swap directions every now and then. So they always have to keep guessing. This formula works really well for me. It's so simple and so effective. Another thing to add is that if I'm going towards a tight loop area, I will take it wide and try to sneak into the tighter gaps, whereas if it's a big open loop, I'll go through the middle and push out from the inside. That way you can flick easier. Okay, so some of you are probably only here for the 180 trick shot. It's actually relatively simple to do if you have a good mouse, and that is that is the way it is. I'm currently using a Def Adder Razor mouse, and I keep my DVD settings at 50% for everything and just crank my DPI up on the Razor to 3000 and I barely have to do any movement. I'll show what movement I do now on paint and it's that simple and you don't need a mouse mat the size of a football field. Just push up and swoop across like you're drawing the top end of a gentleman's cane. Do I think the 180 is viable in all games? Not really. It's very good at very, very specific tiles, but in a 1v1 situation when a survivor is running towards you, it's useless. 90% of survivors don't run dead hard anymore and that was its main trick to use. You know, when survivors are leap towards you, use a dead hard, and you just flick back around on yourself. But I wouldn't kink shame. If people really enjoy making 180 flick montages, that's impressive. And 118 does have its uses. If you're pushed up against a wall and you can flick behind yourself, say if you're in the shack, that's a great way to use it. I've got an example come up with my DPI 500 different. One is 3000, which I'll show you first. And then the second one will be at 2500. So as you can see, nice e easy movement. I'll do the exact same movement with 2,500, and it should equal around 135 degrees, like so. Okay, you can still get a 180 with 2,500, it just requires more mouse mo movement like this. Okay. And now here we can show you it in practice against the survivor. It is a bot, but it's still the same kind of situation. If you're expecting a dead hard to get baited, then watch and learn. Quickly look up, flick back on yourself. The old man Kane, remember that. So this is a tile which is similar to the one I've just been showing you in game and the best way to show you the mouse movement is just using paint. So you want to look down then quickly look up and then once you reach the top of the ceiling point when you're just past the loop you've just got to be just past it you want to just swerve across like this but you want to be holding M1 at the same time okay. And if you have say a bigger mouse map but you don't have the same kind of DPI say if your mouse is a bit cheaper or you don't have one that's got um, a DPI setting change or something like that and you've got a massive mouse map it'd be something along this lines so you want, you want to be like moving quicker and longer so it's 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 easier the more DPI you have you could probably just do something like this say if you had like five or six files of DPI but you're you're going to struggle when you do an M1 attacks because you're just going to be all over the place looking like an absolute nightmare and spinning around all over the shop so you won't be able to get easy hits with your M1 unless you just really enjoy having a really really fast mouse I personally don't I like mine at around 2500 um which means I'm somewhere in the middle of all this but I can get a 180 if I want to it just means I've got to put more effort in and half of the time it's very rare that you're following a, a survivor on this loop, but if you do happen to find yourself on a loop like this, it's the perfect time to go for it. It's like similar to if you say playing the blight, you would like, you'd hit this point and you'd flick round. I cannot play blight at all. Whereas with Oni, it's more sharp. The actual turning point is like this, but the mouse movement is always like this. That's how it looks when you're playing with your mouse. But the, mo the main thing to remember is once you hit this point around here, just as you're passing the loop and you're looking up, don't hold M1 until that point, okay? But there, that's the 180 in a nutshell. It's pretty simple to learn, especially if you've got a good mouse. It's really difficult if you've got a bad mouse. Why don't I do them in my games? That's what some people always ask me. Simply because I do play Variety Killer and I can't be bothered changing my DPI up and down for every game I play. If I broke down my DVD games, I'd probably say I play 50% only, 30% other killers and 20% survivors. So I do play only a lot, but if I'm playing Contras, I like my mouse to be going a bit slower. So I compromise and keep my DPI at 2,500, which you can still do 180 flicks at. Don't get me wrong, you can still do them, but it's a lot harder and I need a bigger mouse mat. Okay, so I'm not a massive fan of the 180s, but I am a big, big fan of hiding your red stain, showing your red stain and tricking survivors into going inside or outside of loops. And there's a few examples here, but this one in particular, I have the other point of view from the streamer who I was playing against and it shows why I tricked him. There's nothing against his playstyle, but it shows that I can turn a 100% chance to a 50-50. So let's watch the clip. So I've paused it here and as you can see, you can see my red stain, you can see my entire body. It looks like I'm about to be coming on the outside of the tile, but really I'm going to follow up with the inside of the loop. So what I'm doing here is I'm pressing my character against 
the tile and nose in it and then pushing myself with the A key along and then following it through. It's just like running in, uh, just called nose rubbing, just rubbing your nose along the uh, tile. And then obviously it goes down. See, this is the exact same skill set I'm using, but I'm doing it a slightly different way. I'm going to go back on myself. As long as you show just enough of your red stain, they have to take the 50-50 chance and it doesn't always pay off for them. So this one is slightly different. This was a Claudette who was a really good looper throughout the game. And whenever I got onto the cars, I'd nose against the back of the car and just fake which side I'm going to. And if you see in both clips, both def different scenarios, I go completely opposite ways. And that way, if you keep changing up throughout the game, they'll never be able to guess which way you're going. And as long as you turn into a 50-50, you've got half a chance. This is a slightly different tile. So the problem I've got here is I'll slow it down a little bit. If I do brush too far forward, I will end up just getting pushed around the loop because it's this is just a hard loop to do this on. But I did hide my, I did show my redstone enough to trick them into going the wrong way. And this will win you so many battles in a 1v1. I'm also sort of combining that with a 135 flick. It's not quite a 180 because the tile's too big to even do that on, but they're really difficult to pull off. Okay, with this ace, it's even slightly more different. I know he's going to a tile here, and I've faked one way, and he doesn't have the time to react. He was going to try and pallet stun me. He didn't have the time to react. It was either throw a pallet or achieve nothing, and yeah, he threw the pallet and he got screwed for it. So where does that take us next? I think the best thing for me to show you would be like a real-time top view version of a map and how I would start the game and why I do certain things and how I would get to where I'm going. So I'll show you this next. Okay, so I found this map on Steam by a guy called Eagerface who has uploaded every single map and tile to Steam, which is incredible. So I'd check that stuff out if you're actually interested. Well, this is how a typical game goes for me. So I spawn in here as the Oni. And I've obviously got Lethal Pursuer on because I do enjoy doing that when I'm playing most of the time. Sometimes I change builds and change different perks and stuff. But as you can see, we've got a Dwight spawning over here, three Leons over here. So obviously, I'm going to head this way towards the Leons. And this will probably cause them to spread out a little bit. This Leon might go over to this gen here. And then this Leon is my target. So I go over to Leon. I hit him once. And then I'm just going to leave him alone. So when I leave him alone, this gen here is not being worked on whatsoever. And this guy's probably going to go over here to the nearest gen because survivors tend to do, they tend to be creatures of habit. So they're going to go, he's going to go to this gen or this gen or one of the, if he's a good survivor, he'll see this as a free gen and go for one of these. So I've got to be aware that this guy over here is dropping all the blood. So I'm, I'm mostly on over to the next Leon who's hopefully stayed at this tile, but he might not have. He might have moved on with this Leon and started working on this gen, which is even better for me because I can then pressure this gen, which someone's been working on all while Dwight has been working away over here on his own. So I'm going to go for my second hit on one of these two Leons. So I've now got two injured players and I've managed to spread them because the whole point of this was to move over to here and move him this way. Because at the start of the game, I've got Lethal Pursuer. I know where Dwight is. I know where all the Leons are. And this guy's on his own. And if he's not got a med kit, he's not getting healed. So I'm going to be aware that there's going to be a pool of blood around this gen, this gen, or this gen, or somewhere around this part of the map. So I'll get my second hit on one of these Leons. That's great, I've almost got my power, then I'll, I'll, I'll suck the power up as I'm following this one around, and then I'll gain that power. And bearing in mind, I'm aware, always at the back of my mind, that Dwight has been working away on this gen, working his little butt off. I've now got my power from this Leon. I'm not going to go for the down unless I see he's a weak survivor, I'll go for the down. And then I activate my power. So Oni has now either downed this Leon and hooked him, all while in the back of his mind he's making his way over to Dwight with his power, and he can pressure this gem, which is probably either complete or very nearly complete. I'm hoping it's the latter, so it's nearly complete. And then I down Dwight. And don't forget, I've downed Dwight. And if I down him really quickly, I'll get him down. I'll put him on a hook. I'll be missing my power now. However, I now know where the other blood is. So I'm going to make my way back this way and go for this Leon here. Okay? All while I'll be maybe sucking my power up, sucking my power up, sucking my power up. Because there'll be, there'll be a trail of it somewhere around here because I've hit two survivors. Once I've activated my power, I'll be heading towards this Leon, or obviously if I can get this Leon down, I will do if he's like an easy target. But if I, if I realise he's a good looper, or he's just not working out, he's, he's, say, say he's made his way to this, 
this uh, tree and it's got really good tiles on it. And I know I'm not going to be able to get him quickly. I will use my power and just mosey on over this way. Because I've gave my power back from all the blood he's left me. And then I'll down this Leon. And if I've done this right, I shouldn't have a single gen popped. And that is the value of Lethal Pursuer. That's why I use it. It's so good at the start of the game. You can really set your game up just from the get-go. Now, a b another game could start this way. I could get really unlucky and every survivor spawns somewhere near a gen. What do I do in this situation? Well, my best bet is to head towards the middle of all four of them because they'll hear my terradius and it might put them off being in that area. So it'll give me a little bit less... Um, it'll give me a little bit more pressure towards them and they might move towards each other, which is which is good for me. I want them to be grouped up on the thing. So I'm heading towards this guy. He's moved over to this guy. And then my Terry, this is around this section. So Dwight might be a bit nervous because most Dwight's are. He'll move away from here, maybe. And if he doesn't, he might say the gen might be brave. I'll get a hit on him. And because I've, I know how survivors tend to work, obviously not all are the same, he should have moved over to here. So I'll head towards this gen with two survivors on it. You want to be pressuring more than one at the same time. If you're not care if you get really really unlucky, you might you might have one survivor who loops you for so long at the start of the game that you get three gens pop at once, and there's nothing you can do about that sometimes. But my only advice for that is, if you see a survivor is really good, leave them alone and just take a mental note of the name and just leave them alone for the game because those kind of survivors don't tend to want to do gens; they want to loop you because that's how they have fun and that's what they've mastered. So th those are the best kind of survivors to leave alone. So you might um start the game and this one's right over to here. If you see a survivor's running to a section which is good for looping, I would leave them alone. I'd just completely ignore them. Even if you were heading towards them in the first place and just go for a different one. Sometimes you get a game where all four of them are amazing at looping and they, they just have sprint burst and get you to the loop they want to get you to and you just get beaten. And that's the problem with the Oni. The Oni has a really high skill cap for his power. If you don't get your power, you are screwed. And certain survivors, I could be following this Leon all all around the map, all around the map. And he throws every single pallet down. These three could crank all the gens out easily. I've had so many games where I've got to the um, last gen popping and I've managed to secure like a two or three K, but it's been so sweaty because the first survivor and my ego's kicked in and I've wanted to try and get them. But yeah, I just thought I'd give this as, as an example of how I tend to start my games and what's a good way to manage the survivors at the start of the game. And that's why Lethal Pursuer is a must, in my opinion, if you want to really get good with him because... Half of the battle is getting that first hit, and this is how you tend to get the first hit. It's a pretty cool diagram, and uh, only looking pretty hot. Okay, in regards to builds, if I was playing solely just to win, and you, like, say money's no object, and you can get any perks you want, I would recommend this, which is Lethal Pursuer, Eruption, Sloppy Butcher, and Deadlock. So you've got a little bit of all reading with Lethal Pursuer and Eruption. You've got a bit of slowdown with Sloppy, Deadlock, and Eruption again. And they just seem to complement each other quite nicely. And it'd be really... This is what I would use if I was going into a sweaty game and I knew I was playing against really, really good survivors and it was it was like make or break kind of win. So that's this build, which is probably my most recommended build just for winning. But this isn't a fun build, in my opinion. Again, a similar setup for builds. This build would be for someone who, say, can only afford to buy one other killer, which would be Nemesis, because you gain Lethal Pursuer and Eruption with Nemesis. Sloppy Butcher and Fearmonger are both perks which you can get with the base game now that Demogorgon's um, no longer accessible. So that's like the cheap budget build. Okay, so this would be a build with someone who is basically just got the game and they want to just, just play only, they only just bought the game. So you've got Nurses Calling, Bitter Murmur, Sloppy Butcher and Blood Echo. So you should be able to get this build with only having bought the only. Everything else you'll have to obviously farm to get. But this would be the cheapest of the cheap build and it's got a nice bit of all reading. You've got a little bit of gen knowledge. You've got a little bit of slowdown with Sloppy Butcher. And I think you'd have to do a lot of hook trading with this build because you won't have much gen pressure. But once you hook a survivor and they're all still injured because of Sloppy, everyone's got hemorrhage and exhaust state effect for 45 seconds, which is really nice, especially the exhaust state effect. Okay, so this would be a build for people who can afford to get killers with shards, but they don't have any money to buy them with like real money because they've played the game a lot as a survivor or something and just want to play only now. So you've got monitor and abuse, which is the Doctor perk. And this is really good for getting those early hits, which as I've mentioned before, is one of the most important things is the only to get that early first hit because you've got a lesser terror radius. Then corrupt intervention to give you a bit of slowdown at the start of the game. Tinkerer, which will give you some gen knowledge, which is really really nice and it'll also help getting that early hit 
and then no way out for the end game spice. This would be a really, really nice build, especially if you're getting more used to the Oni, so you've like dipped your toe in a bit and you've learned how to do a few of his maneuvers. But yeah, I mean, I've got a video with two hours worth of footage and every single build in that video is totally different and I play two of those builds, so I'll leave that in the description. I recommend watching it if you really want to like learn how to play certain builds and different types. That's like... I think he used like 32 perks, something or 36 perks in total in like eight games. It was all completely different. It was a good, good like experience and it was really good to learn. But yeah, that's as far as the builds go, in my opinion. There's there's so many perks in this game now, but just have fun with it. Just try going perkless as well if you are just dying out as only. Okay, so the add-ons. I always like to run Akito's Crutch and Lion Fang because you get a little bit more duration, which is 10 seconds, which is pretty nuts. And Akito's Crutch gives you a bit more movement speed. Sometimes I like to be a bit spicy and use, say, Shadowborn with Akito's Crutch and um, and the K9 Zen Talisman. However you say that word, I'm not sure. So you get giga movement speed. And it's I wouldn't recommend that if you're just starting out the only. I'd probably recommend going for something like the Lion's Fangs along with um, the Wooden Oni Mask. So you get the orbs more frequently and you get a longer duration. So you can really learn how to play the Oni. I'm not going to do a tier list on the add-ons. In my opinion, duration ones, speed ones, anything which will increase the duration and give you more speed or give them uh, the survivors dropping more orbs is always good. The two iridescent ones are very niche. I would say the um, the iridescent Vami Crest is absolute garbage. The bloody glove has its uses. I have done a video with that as well, and it it is kind of funny. You get some like knowledge of where the survivors are, and they're, they're probably really confused as to why you're getting it. But yeah, his add-ons, there's not much to say about them because there's not a lot going on. I think he's got a really boring add-on set, but they are useful. So it's, you know, I do hope his um, iridescent ones do get a rework at some point. But yeah, this is add-ons. There's not a lot else to say about them. So next I'll be going over the maps. And just before I do that, if anyone has a killer they would like buying for them, any form of chapter, I don't mind, leave the comment of which one you want in the comment section. And I'm going to put everyone into a hat or a virtual hat and I'll pull out a name at random and whoever gets it I'll just buy them a chapter. I thought I'd put this in midway through the video when people might have lost interest so if you haven't lost interest and you've stuck around then you might be rewarded for it. So just leave a comment of which chapter you want or which killer you'd like. I'd recommend Nemesis if you are going to learn Oni if you've not got him already because Lethal Pursuer is god tier. But yeah, onto the maps. So in regards to maps, I feel like it'd be easier just to go through the realms because each map to me with the Oni are kind of transferable. I know certain maps are very much more difficult than other ones. Say with Cauldron Farm, there's some really difficult ones in there. But going forward, this is how I'm going to do it. So Oni Smash is obviously his best ones. So you've got the Auto Haven Wreckers, you've got the McMillan Estate, and you've got the Crotus Pen Asylum. They're just really easy to tra traverse. The loops aren't too bad. It's got some tight ones, but as long as you approach them how I tend to approach them, which is go into the tight loops from the outside and go on the big loops from the inside. You can push survivors in and out and how you want them to. And these three maps or these three realms, I find Auto, Auto Haven Wreckers really, really easy to get wins on. So next you've got the Oni Grin. So these aren't too bad. Um, they're not too far away from being the Oni Smash section. You've got the Dead Dog Saloon maps, um, which is the Grave of Glendale realm. And you've got the Red Forest, which consists of the Plagues map and the Huntress's map, which is a nice big map, but the loops aren't too bad again. There's another rule of thumb as well with the Grave of Glendale map. Just ignore the generator on the top. There's no point in going for it. Leave that area alone. Don't chase survivors around it. It's going to make your life very difficult. Some of the loops are just not worth trying. And if you just follow one survivor through that building, you could end up losing three gens very quickly. And then you've got the farm maps, which is the Coldwind Farm. Now, these probably would be the S tier for the Oni, but I really suffer with corn blindness. Sometimes I find it really difficult to track survivors. It's, I don't know, maybe I need to change my colour settings a little bit. I'm not, I'm not colour blind, it's just I've, the corn is annoying. I think maybe I should uh, turn down my graphic settings, but I do tend to win most games on that one as well, but I just find there is certain variants of that realm which are very, very difficult, and also corn is just a bit of a nightmare for me. And then the Yamako state. I think I said that right, Yamako? Maybe. Um, those maps on there, they're all kind of samey. I don't mind them too much. Pretty uh, pretty solid maps. Then we move on to the Oni Meh section, which you've got Mount Ormond, which is a very, very big map, or it feels very big. It might not be one of the biggest ones, but it does feel like one of the biggest ones. It's got 
um, generators on either side of the um, of the main building. If you lose that main building generator, you can you're gonna really suffer. Even with Oni's power, it's you could waste your power just by tra uh, traversing the map. Also, in there you've got the Silent Hill map. Um, again, it depends on the survivors you go against. If you go against really competent survivors, uh, this could be a really rough map. But this could easily be an only smash map, or the variants of it can be. It it depends on the survivors in that situation. I know it depends on the survivors for most games, but that map, it, for me personally, it's a very 50-50 map. Only sad. So, the swamp, I really dislike the maps in the swamp. I just don't... Uh, me, this is a personal opinion as well. It's not just going off, um, say, not starter list or something like that. This is what I don't like as an only player. The swamp, I find really frustrating. I find there's, like, random rocks which can block your bonks which are very very annoying so the swamp variants i just don't like that much at all but for me it's not a hard map i just don't like playing it then you've got Haddonfield, which i've never liked i didn't like it before the rework i didn't like it after the rework it's got it feels like it's got god loops everywhere and it feels like some of the buildings you can run for minutes and minutes in a game are, are very frustrating um, and then that goes on to the Knights Realms maps, which is called the Borgo map, I think, or Shattered Squares. All of, that, all of those maps don't like. There's too many pallets. It feels massive, and it feels like it's absolutely littered with pallets. It's nice and open, so you can see people. I feel with Oni, he's very similar to the nurse, and you want to be able to see the survivors at most of the, most of the time, especially if you have power, so you can actually like figure out where they are, um, especially if you're trying to do like a long-distance play. Um, probably similar to Billy as well. And then Eerie of Crows, I didn't like that again before the rework, and I still don't like it that much. It feels, still feels pretty big, even though they've reworked it. Um, don't like the main building, and I don't like how bright it is. I just don't like the map. Um, I have had wind on it, and also there's a lot of trees with random like bush, which can like stop you from swinging your um your mace down. It's quite frustrating. And then the saddest ones, the only cry. You've obviously got the doctor's map which is the Larry's Institute. Um, RPD, all variants. Even though East Wing of RPD is really easy to free gen, it, it's still just not fun to play. It doesn't feel good using your power on it, but the map itself, you, if, if you didn't even have your power, you could win on that map, especially East Wing. And then you've got the Garden of Sadness. I cannot stand that map. It's got one side of the map, which feels really easy to traverse, and then you've got another side, which has like some insane god loops, and I cannot stand them. I, I just really don't like that map at all. And then there's a Gideon Meat Plant, Pallet Pallet City. Uh, you can spend five, six minutes chasing one survivor if they throw every single pallet down. And because at the start of the game, you're an M1 killer, it's the most idiot-proof map for a survivor to play. You can literally run from one pallet to another to another. And if you're playing against a good survivor who wants to win, this isn't their fault, you're never going to hit them until all the gens are popped. Then you'll have your power, and then you're into a slugfest, which isn't really fun for anyone in that situation. It's quite stressful. I've had a few games where I've won with not a single hook until the very end game. So I don't really enjoy playing that because you're up against it, and it's quite stressful for the sake of nothing. And then, obviously, I'm missing a map on this tier list because someone's made it, and it's not put the latest map on the Torbus landing. I don't like the map. It's too bright. It's too full of foliage. It's just annoying. Um... So yeah, this is just a tier list for maps and my opinions on them and realms for the Oni. Torbus Landon, I'd probably put in Oni Sad or Oni Cry. It's just so bright and so... And it's got another one with a building which has a generator at the top of it, which I just ignore. I just ignore anything what has a building with a generator at the very tippy top of it. Just ignore it. I'm not talking about main buildings like um, the Ormond one. I'm talking about ones like Grave of Glendale. Um, what else is there? The... Garden of Sadness has one, and probably, no, I'd say the Crows of Pen Asylum has okay ones, you can actually still go for them ones. Mainly the Grave of Glendale and Tobus Landing, those two are in particular are very nasty for having a generator on the top, which you can waste a lot of time just by trying to chase someone. Overall, Oni is good on most maps though, even the indoor ones he can be good on, it, it's just quite difficult to track survivors, especially on like the Doctor's map, indoor maps can be rough for him, but yeah, that's the maps. I almost forgot Badham. I don't know how I almost forgot it. It's because the pitch wasn't in there, but I really dislike these maps. They they suck. <laughs> and if you ever get taken to Badham and me personally, if I've ever been sent there by an offering of a survivor, that survivor's usually a douchebag. I'm not, <laughs> not going to beat around the bush, but 
I, I just don't like these maps at all. Uh, there's the um, there's the House of Pain as well. Uh, it just I'd ignore certain gens as ones which are in the House of Pain or just in basements and just try and focus on the ones on the outside because you're going to have a rough time going for them. And if, you've, if you're against a competent survivor who has mastered Badham and sends you there, you're going to be in for a rough time, especially if it's swift. But yeah, Badham it could easily be on the only cry section, could easily be on the only grin section. It's just one of those where it depends on who you're playing against and it also depends on on just how you're playing that day. If you if you have a rough time where you bounce off random foliage, that might happen as well. But I just I really dislike bad ham and I just I don't know why I really, really don't like them. So with all that being said, you guys did ask for an in-depth guide and I've tried to give my best kind of guide for him. Where would I rank him in terms of all the other killers? So I would say he's mid to low A tier. Against very good survivors, like, I mean, very good survivors, they will pre-drop every pallet and you'll never get your power and you'll end up having a very miserable time. I've had games like that and it sucks, but that is the best way to play against the Oni. However, against mediocre to lower survivors, he could easily be an S-tier killer. But I think somewhere around the A tier is fine. If you do get that early hit in, it's great and the games can end very quickly, especially if you go into an absolute slugfest. His perks are okay. He's got Zanshin Tactics. Blood Echo and Nemesis, they can all be used to complement other builds. So overall, he's a really fun killer. He's probably one of the most well-designed, well-balanced killers in the game because you take some learning. He's got, I wouldn't say he's a very hard difficulty. I'd say he's hard. I think very hard is a bit unfair to the other killers who are very hard. He has a really, really weak early game. He has a really, really strong late game. And I think that's a really cool way to balance a kill. There's not many kills like him. And that's why I really love, love playing him. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you did learn something from this. If you did, like, subscribe, other YouTube things. Take care.